You are now live. Thanks, Jill. So uh, I'll uh, call the meeting to order. We do have quorum. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, participating on a not so nicest day of the year so far, I would argue. But um, in terms of uh, the agenda, our first item, even before approval of minutes, is uh, election of a vice chair. We've been I think almost the whole uh, year uh, since Jason had to uh, step down, Jason Janae, uh, without a vice chair. Um, so, uh, Jill, um, I I kind of remember the process, but but uh, run me uh, through. I think what we're looking for first is people to uh, nominate themselves or others. Am I right on that? Jill, can you hear me? Hi, Mr. Chair. This is Andrea Lavassi Wood from oh, the hi, office. Andrea. Hi, how are you? Good, Jill's how are having you? <laughs> pretty good. Jill's experiencing some feedback. Um, so I believe um, that uh, Jill has the order of how the election goes and the annotated agenda, if you want to follow along with that. Oh. But you are correct that you do ask for nominations from the floor. So if you want to proceed. Uh, so, sure. And you... actually, I just realized I'm just in front of my computer for the first time today. So I have the annotated agenda, uh, which makes my life a lot easier. So, um, so uh, looking at that, then we're opening the floor for nominations. Um, so I'm opening the floor for nominations. Okay, that wasn't quite the response I expected. Um, I will open it up uh, again, uh, just with the caveat that uh, being vice chair, I was vice chair. Uh, it's uh, lots of fun and generally the chair shows up. So there, uh, it's not a lot of, uh, not, not a huge amount of work and great um, if you're thinking about becoming a chair in the, uh, uh, in the future for an HR committee. So with that hard sell, anyone uh, any nominations? I can do it. It's Laura. I can nominate myself. <laughs> Great. Okay. I'll, I'll second that. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Mason. Um, okay. So I will call. Are there any other nominations? I will be doing it three times for the second time. Any further nominations? Third time's the charm. Any other, uh, any further nominations? Okay. Uh, if not, I'll um, call for nominations uh, to uh, cease. Uh, we have a mover and seconder for vice uh, chair. So I think I'm able to uh, call for uh, the question um, and um, I'm calling the question. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, and uh, any contraminder? Okay. Well, I'm happy to declare, Laura, that you are our new vice chair. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. 
Okay, so with that, uh, we'll move to uh, item number two, which is approval of the minutes. We have two sets of minutes, uh, one January 25th, 2021, one February 22nd, uh, 2021. Um, assuming we all reviewed it with surgical scrutiny, um, any errors or omissions? Not that I noticed. Okay. If not, um, I think we should do it in two motions. Um, so uh, I'll start with January 25th, 2021. Will someone move approval? Happy to move that, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Councillor Mason, I didn't hear what you said, but you're now our seconder. I... Happy to be the seconder. Great. Um, I'll call for the question. Uh, all in favor, signify by aye. 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 Great. Contraminded, nay. Approved. Uh, February 22nd, 2021 minutes. Can we have a mover, please? I'll move them. Margo, thank you. A seconder? I'll do that, Laura. Thank you, thank you Laura. Um, again, I'll call for the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Contraminded? Great, both, uh, both uh, motions are uh, carried. Uh, next, look for a uh, motion to approve the, uh, to approve the agenda. I can do that. Thank you, Laura, seconder. Thank you, Rick. Um, I'll call for the question, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Contraminded? Great. Okay. Uh, next, we have business arising out of the minutes. There are none. Uh, next, um, um, I will ask if any uh, call for declaration of conflict of interest. Uh, does anyone have a uh, conflict of interest that they wish to declare? Great. Um, next, uh, consideration of deferred business, none, uh, that brings us to item seven, correspondence, petitions, and delegations. Uh, we wait for our first delegation, not today. Um, uh, correspondence, uh, Jill, any, I, hopefully you're back connected okay and got the echo fixed. Any, any correspondence? Sorry, Mr. Chair, Jill's still having some issues. Okay. So I'm just double checking with her to see if there's correspondence. Okay. There was no correspondence received. Great, uh, no petitions. And so that brings us uh, item eight, no information items. So let's uh, go to, uh, um, uh, brought forward at least none. So we have uh, item number nine, um, which is reports, and 9.1.1 is the regional plan review themes and directions report presentation. Silo, are you doing that? Yes, I'm, I'm doing that. Okay, I'll turn it over to you then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to see if I can share my screen. It seems it says I cannot share yet. I don't know who the host is, Shiloh. I'm not the host. I, I assume maybe it's Jill. Yeah. It's month 18 of the pandemic. <laughs> We're still waiting for control. Works, how are we doing out there? We're good. I'm just ready for the pandemic to be over. Second shot on Sunday. Getting it, getting it on Sunday. Can't wait. 
Just just a moment. I appreciate everyone's patience. I'm just waiting for Jill to assign me as a host because she wasn't able to promote Shiloh. Just a moment, please. Shiloh has permission now so that she, you, um, she can share her presentation. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes, yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Shiloh Gimpton, and I'm a planner with Regional Planning. I'm here to introduce you to the Regional Plan Review Project. While I have the pleasure of leading the presentation today, we have a great team of people working on this project. The people on this slide are the core project team, and Leah Perrin is with me here today. But a project like the Regional Plan Review cuts across the whole of our organization. Many people have been involved with this work to date, and we want to acknowledge their contributions. We are here today because we are reviewing the Regional Plan, which means we are evaluating our land use policies and making sure they represent the direction of the Council would like to set. We are contemplating how the municipality is physically organized and growing. We kicked off this phase of public engagement on May 20th at Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee, which is the primary advisory body for this work. We have a heavy engagement program planned for this month, and we are consulting with committees of council, advisory boards, and internal staff teams, as well as stakeholders and the broader public. The website is our one-stop shop for all information on this plan review shapercityhalifax.ca slash regional dash plan. Here's a quick peek at our webpage on the right and some important dates on the left. We have a survey live until July 16th, and we conducted a series of live virtual Q and A's in the past few days, all on different topic areas. Videos, videos of these are posted on, posted on YouTube now, and copies of the presentation slides and transcripts of the questions will be available on our website. Now, just to step back and make sure everyone understands the regional plan, it is the strategic document, the first planning document adopted after amalgamation that provided a region-wide vision for land use. First adopted in 2006, it provided a comprehensive outline of how growth and development should take place until 2031. The regional plan is powerful in guiding the municipality's planning and decision-making. As a high-level policy document, it does a few different things. First, the plan provides policy direction for planning at the regional and community level. The regional plan sits above the community or secondary plan level documents and above our land use bylaws and sets region-wide policy intent. While some, where something is important enough that it should apply everywhere, regional plan policy can set up land use bylaw regulations that will be applied region-wide. This has been done most often for our environmental regulations. So for example, for setbacks from water courses, those policies sit in a regional plan and the regulations are rolled out in every community's land use bylaw. It can establish the municipality's intent to do future research programs or studies. For example, the 2006 regional plan called for a series of transportation priorities plans, including a road network plan, which ultimately became the integrated mobility plan. With its adoption, there's ongoing work related to that plan that will get its own direction in the regional plan. And finally, the regional plan identifies where there are needs for different types of programming or opportunities to partner with community or other levels of government. For example, our mobility network is managed by different levels of government and can be supported through partnerships with other groups across our community. The regional plan supports the rural transit funding program which provides grants to community-based transit services in rural areas. This represents the progression of the regional plan over the past 15 years. In 2006, we approved the original, the original regional plan with the 25-year horizon, and we intended to review it every five years. The first review, which was called RP Plus 5, started in 2011, was adopted in 2014. We we're working on this review in 2020, that's when we started, and you can see we're aiming to complete this review in 2022. The 
end of the plan horizon is 2031. The themes and directions document was recently released as our first major deliverable of this review. It outlines the key ideas and planning issues we will address in the review. It's a chance to step back and ask everyone, do we have this right? Are we headed in the right direction? The feedback we receive will help to provide focus and direction of our work during the review. The themes and directions document includes 11 themes, considering the regional scale, building healthier and more complete communities, reconsidering employment and industrial lands, transforming how we move in our region, social planning for community well-being, celebrating culture and heritage, integrated community parks and facilities, enhancing environmental protection, leading through climate change, imagining HRM into 2050 and beyond, and assessing the impacts of COVID-19. I won't go into the detail of each theme during this presentation, but if you're interested in specific topics, I would invite you to visit our website to read the material, and I'm also happy to try to answer any questions you have today. There are a few key questions we're trying to answer through the review. The first is, how do we locate housing and employment in smart strategic locations so that growth can happen easily and in a way that furthers the municipality's most important goals? We can break this down into two key questions. First, how are we growing? We need to evaluate the projected demand for housing and employment today and into the future. To do this, we are relying on two key pieces of information, our housing and population analysis and our industrial and employment land analysis. The second question we ask is, where should we grow? Once we know how much we're going to grow, we begin to assess where new housing and jobs can be accommodated. It isn't only about where there are pieces of land that can be developed, but where that land is located as it relates to the location of services and infrastructure. We think about how and where we can infill or where we should expand the city into greenfield areas. This is done with careful consideration as to how development can be serviced with water, sewer, transit, recreation, and studying how we should be preserving or protecting the important pieces of ecological or cultural land. And as regional council has identified aspirations for sustainable futures, such as integrated mobility plans, mode share targets, and the emission reduction targets in Halifax, we can update our modeling and assess how different land use growth scenarios might interact with these long-term objectives. As we define how growth should be best located, we also can assess how the development should be organized to enable sustainable people-oriented design. We can also break the community scale work down into two key questions. How should our communities change as we grow? We can define our vision for how this new growth should occur. We have done this through the center plan process for the regional center, and now we're looking to continue this work in the suburban and rural areas of our municipality. We can set out what our community design objectives are and start to envision where centers, quarters, and other important places are and what they should become in the future. We also need to assess how will we organize brand new communities. Places we are going to expand the service boundary are usually greenfield areas without significant amounts of existing development. As we build these brand new communities, we need to consider how the development can be organized to protect ecological and cultural resources, as well as how regional infrastructure should be upgraded to accommodate the growth. And finally, as our region is growing, we can turn our minds to planning for the long term. Our ideas about what the future may look like could change drastically over a few decades. Factors such as immigration, climate change, social movements, and pandemics can all have an impact how we plan our communities. The regional priorities plan that were initiated through the 2014 regional plan review has started to focus on long range planning by creating work plans and policies that tackle climate change, protecting and connecting open spaces, nurturing our culture and heritage, and connecting our communities through a variety of means, transit, active transportation, as well as vehicles. Now that the regional plan is nearing the end of its lifespan and our population growth has doubled since the last plan review, it is time to begin thinking about what we want HRM to look like further into the future. As 2020 has taught us, society can change dramatically over a short time. Our planning asks us how the municipality can be better prepared to handle 
an uncertain future and to some extent even direct what the future can look like based on a shared vision. This is our key contact information, www.shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash regional dash plan, email regional plan at halifax.ca and phone 902-233-2501. We're happy to take questions and comments from you today. We have been suggesting to committees that we've been meeting that you may wish to submit a letter to us with your comments after the meeting, or if individual committee members would like to submit comments, we would welcome that as well. Any questions or comments that we hear from you today will become part of the public record. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the, the discussion. Uh, thanks, Shiloh, very much. Um, so I take it that that kind of for the next step is is if people have uh, some uh, uh, comments, um, we can make them now or we can make them later. Is that pretty much? Did I get that right? Yeah, it's there's a lot of information in it. If you go to our website, we have lots of chapters and background documents and issue papers. So it's a lot of information to digest, but people have some comments for now, that's where we welcome that. Or if people would like some time to look at the documents and get back to us, that's perfectly okay as well. Great. Well, I'll, I'll open the floor and certainly invite it if someone does want to make a, uh, a, a comment uh, now, um, um, please, uh, please do. And were you? I can Hi. Well, yeah, okay. I do. I was reading the documents, and it's it's all very lovely. It looks great. Uh, of course, my question, being in the HRM and and having to go through that horrible rotary, went, well, not so much for the last two years with the pandemic, but it can be a real nightmare. And uh, I, it mentions transportation here. My question is: Is there any uh, indication that they will? ever be any consideration for a monorail or anything for the uh, outlying areas to get to the city faster and in different places? I, I know that Toronto has above above ground uh, monorails. I can take that one. Um, my name is Leah Perrin. I'm a principal planner with, uh, with regional policy program and uh, I'm working on this regional plan review. Um, the integrated mobility plan is the, um, you know, most up to date, I guess, uh, transportation document, mobility document that we're working with. And we also have recently adopted the uh, rapid transit strategy, which at least guides uh, us around um, transit in yes. sort of ser existing serviced areas. One of the things that we have done um, in the themes and directions document is identified that we would like to start uh, working on our long range transit planning. So uh, the as sort of end of the rapid transit strategy, as you set that up, you know, we, uh, we know pretty well about where we'll provide uh, rapid transit uh, to our service areas in the next sort of 10 years, but um, what, what beyond 2030. So, um, that's one major area of study that we're looking to set up through this review. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, uh, can I indulge with a second question? Sure. Uh, and the second question is, um, a lot of my friends are my age or slightly older, and we're of the age where a lot of people are looking at retirement. Of course, I've been retired since 2018. But... Um, uh, I've been very fortunate in that I've, I've had a government job for all my life and my pension is fairly secure, but there are people that are not as fortunate as me and some of those friends are particularly bothered by the, by the um, amount of rent that people are asking for. So, and I don't know whether this committee has anything to do with that, but uh, affordable housing for seniors, is that in this plan or is it somewhere else? Yeah, so the regional plan review uh, is a high level document. It sort of set, sets the tone for all of the work we're doing. And one of the major pieces of work that our team does is around housing, uh, affordable housing and housing supply generally. Um, so there, there's lots of information um, on, you may be interested, we, we did some um, like a, a, a few live Q and A's last week 
Uh, and one of the major topics is on housing. So I'd encourage you to watch, go to our website and click on the link for the housing Q&A. Uh, it sure. will uh, outline the sort of work that we've been doing around housing. And um, yes, absolutely, that's something we're working through. Great, thank you very much. Great, thanks. Um, other uh, other question comments? Rick, did you put up your hand there? Yep, I did. Um, actually, that raised an interesting question for me because when I was reading it, uh, the documents and thinking about the, the, the boundary in which transport is provided, um, it didn't sort of cross my mind, but we have neighboring municipalities that are busy developing and generating increasing numbers of commuters. and. I know places like Ottawa have set limits on how much they develop their suburban areas. And the net result is you get this donut effect where you've got this big area of non-development in the municipality. And then the next municipality over is the next place people can buy a house. So they all live there and then you've got worse traffic nightmares. So I was just wondering how this plan takes that into account. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of development in Enfield and Elmsdale and people are commuting from Truro in the Valley the South Shore, and those are all beyond the boundaries of HRM, but they're going to affect the transportation requirements. Do you want to go ahead, Chad? I was just going to ask if you could uh, step in. <laughs> sure, no problem. Um, uh, yeah, so through the chair, I guess, if we're supposed to do that. Um, yes, the, uh, we, one of the things we are thinking about is, uh, you know, obviously we do have a, a um, fairly tight growth boundary in our municipality as, as it is sort of the division between suburban and, uh, and rural. And we are also very interested in what happens sort of within that hour commute around um, around our our region. So, you know, we are obligated uh, by the HRM charter to um, uh, consult with our adjacent municipalities. So we're, we certainly will be talking with and have been talking with our, um, uh, you know, colleagues in East Hans and, and other places. Um, and that is certainly one thing that we'll, we'll start to think about. I mean, it's, um, as we're thinking more about how COVID has changed the way that we work and where we live, um, you know, it's definitely a, a, a topic of interest about, you know, if, if there is more opportunity for kind of regional coordination. So uh, yes, that's definitely a part of the work that we do. Yeah. Margo, please. Um. I, I sat in on the uh, housing webinar last week, and it was kind of interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering about the issue of the urban reserve designation. Uh, it says in the, in the plan that you're going to, that it will be looked at, or you're looking at lifting or revisiting those areas, um, depending on changing circumstances. So what, you know? <laughs> That's a little bit scary because when they when we first um, developed the regional plan, uh, it was sort of like these urban reserve areas are not even going to be considered for development until after uh, 2030, I guess, or after 25 years. But it sounds here like it, it might be uh, they might be opened up earlier than that. Yeah, so there are two uh, unique ones. Uh, one is the uh, Acoma lands, which are uh, the lands of the former uh, Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children on um, Highway 7 in Westfall. And uh, one of the actions of the African Nova Scotian Road to Economic Prosperity was to consider uh, the, the planning for that area and if there are, you know, whether we should be considering that. So for that one, we have recommended that we um, consider uh, lifting the urban reserve and studying. Um, what it, what type of other alternative planning it could become. Uh, so that is one uh, that has a sort of, it's, it's special, it's got a unique circumstance there. Um, the other that has a, a sort of change in circumstance is the, um, the lands in the Persil's Cove backlands area where HRM uh, recently acquired uh, the, uh, the biggest portion of it for the Shaw Wilderness Park. So in that case, uh, we have this piece of land that is a park and will no longer be envisioned for service development in the future. 
um, but there are lands to the west and east of the park uh, where we need to consider what the alternative designation is there. So uh, we've just flagged that obviously the like the, the Hellbox Green Network Plan actually has that as an action that we need to consider the like an alternative designation to urban reserve in those areas. Um, and there's additional work to be done. And um, for the other urban reserves, we're not recommending uh, any particular change, but um, it's worth, you know, through the regional plan review always, we would take a look and make sure that what we have is like still makes sense. Uh, and then we'll be setting up for the long term, you know, what do we need to study, you know, 2031. I know it's don't it's 10 years, but it comes fast and that's these long term policy planning projects that so we need to be uh, studying these things early, setting up that we're going to be studying them so we can, you know, think about kind of how how we address this in the long range. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 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 Well, great, some good questions and feedback so far. Um, oh, oh, another one. Margot, go ahead. Um, we're talking about food security and those issues. Um, is there any um, sort of discussion about getting rid of covenants? You know, like I think, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Sobeys has a covenant that where no other grocery store can be built within so many, you know, kilometers of the store that they have. And this has created a lot of food deserts in the HRM, you know, so there's some in Dartmouth and North End Halifax. Is there any discussion there about getting rid of those covenants that are so damaging to communities? Yeah, so one of our colleagues um, in regional planning is uh, working on the Just Food Action Plan right now. They've been running workshops in the last uh, little bit for some public engagement. So I would expect that as part of that action plan, that that is probably something that will be identified. It may, you know, whether, I don't know the details, so whether it re would require, you know, some kind of provincial provincial intervention, um, you know, we're, we're always bound by what we can do under the charter um, and, you know, by other... Is that a provincial thing, not a, not a municipal thing? Uh, well, we, how would I explain that? Um, we're, I don't know how those, how those covenants are necessarily set up. We, you know, if there's a, a something legal registered on title, the municipality isn't able to sort of unilaterally go in and say this thing no longer exists. Now the province maybe could, I'm not sure of the legalities there. I don't, I'm not sure what the legislation. Um, but I would expect that that would be a barrier that the Just Food Action Plan would be identifying. And, you know, they may come up with something. So, yeah, if you're interested in the um, in that work that's ongoing and they have a website on Shaper City as well. So, so it's called the Just Food Initiative? Just Food, yep. Thanks. Um, just looking around... Laura, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but if you have something that, um, but if you don't, that's okay too. I don't really have a question. I am curious as to how the public engagement uh, component is going and if you're satisfied with the response or if you haven't actually had as much response as you'd like. I'm just, it's just me being curious about how that part's going because I know it can be tough. Yeah, so I, I can answer that one. So we do have a survey up on our Shaker City website, and I think we checked the stats recently, and I think it was maybe approximately 500 people or 460 or so have completed the survey. There's also some statistics on how many people have accessed the website, but right now it, it says how many hits for the entire Shaker City, so we have to break down, break that down a bit further. Uh, we've had some the Q&A sessions, and we've had some attendees ranging between two and 12 or 14 people. So I think now as we're moving into the, the nicer weather, uh, people maybe not want to attend the live event, but they can always watch the virtual events afterwards whenever they want, because they've all been recorded. And so um, that website, the survey is open until the 16th. So we'll see how that goes until mid uh, July. And then we're also gearing up for stakeholder meetings as well. And I'm not sure, Lee, if you wanted to add anything further to that. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is that, um, 
the regional plan review as the sort of high level overarching document, you know, we've done a lot of work since 2014. So 2014 was the last plan review. It set up that we would do a, a, lo a lot of work on these priorities plans. So the Halifax Green Network Plan, the Integrated Mobility Plan, Halifax, and uh, the forthcoming Sharing Our Stories, Culture and Heritage Priorities Plan. That's all work that we've done. And there's been huge amounts of uh, engagement around each of those plans. And then a, a lot of the work that we're doing in the regional plan review is actually just pulling that up into the regional plan to make sure it has the sort of level of um, you know, policy support that it needs in, in the regional plan. So um, a lot of the feedback that we've received through those processes, like we're just saying, hey, we're, we're gonna do the thing that we already committed to doing. So I think people have been engaged um, pretty well across the board since 2014. And um, as a result, I think our early engagement on in this process is sort of showing that people are generally okay. We haven't had any, um, you know, hugely negative things. I mean, the biggest thing for this uh, review and the change between now and 2014 is just certainly how fast we've grown. Uh, so we're seeing lots of urgency around um, housing, uh, lots of urgency around how we'll provide for infrastructure, lots of urgency around how we'll sort of protect um, uh, green space and, and natural areas and wilderness areas as we grow. So uh, those are all hot topics and it's exciting. Um, I did have one question as well, Maria here. Um, I was noting in uh, the livable communities, I think, section that there was um, some focus on moving employment to where people are already living. And how is that balanced against um, the potential to, for emptying out of the downtown? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Certainly the complete communities idea is making sure that we have, you know, opportunities for people to have services close to where they live. Um, but people live downtown too, right? So we're also focusing uh, lots of new development in the regional center. And uh, those people I suspect will continue to, to live and work in the regional center. Um, it's uh, as we are, I guess, maybe if I take a step back, one of the, the sort of key pieces of the integrated mobility plan. It talks about uh, making sure that we direct high uh, housing and employment density where we can connect to transit. So um, employment, you know, the, the regional plan is, is quite good around the, the structure that we've created for housing and we haven't been quite as sophisticated in how we direct employment. Um, and we just wanna get better at that. So it's, it's a, just another sort of layer of, of how we work. Yeah, I don't know if that answers it, but that's, you know, it's something we're continuing to work on, I think. Great, thank you. Um, okay, let me see. All right, so I have another question as well. And uh, the question is, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yep. you can hear me? Good. So the question is, um, uh, you, it talks about immigration and people coming into the community. My husband and I often look at the uh, the houses for sale and uh, being on the market. And when you go to look at who's been looking at the houses that are for sale, a lot of those people that are looking are from the United States and Great Britain. Are you seeing that reflected in the immigration that is happening in the last, say, year? I don't know if we have the detailed breakdown of uh, where people are coming from. Certainly Statistics Canada um, gives a breakdown of um, immigration generally, uh, but I, I don't know off the top of my head whether we have a breakdown of, of um, where in the world they're coming from. Uh, really we need, uh, the migration numbers in our population projections are both uh, immigration, so from outside of the country and also, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking here, but from migration from other provinces and also migration from other parts of Nova Scotia. So there's different components of migration uh, that factor in. So one of the things we've seen is really strong intra-provincial migration. So lots of people coming uh, from Ontario, from Alberta, um, where we haven't seen those high numbers uh, in years past. Okay. 
Um, and did you have another question? Oh, Rick, Rick, sorry, Matt, why don't you go first? And then we'll... Sort of a comment slash question, I guess. Um, and just by way of history, I'm a, I'm a recently retired family doctor. So over the years, I kind of worked my way through four different family practice offices around the uh, Cull Harbor, drifting towards Baker Drive area. And in recent years, I was also sort of zone department head for family practice for Central Zone, amongst other things. Um, you know, when I was looking at the section about complete communities, I was thinking about the fact that you need to make sure that there's available medical care, specifically primary care and family doctors in those communities. And, uh, and you know, it, it's, it, it, it ranges, in, there's a number of factors. Sometimes there's um, city regulations about what kind of businesses you can place where and family doctors are considered to be businesses and they're small business people. So, and, and they work on a fixed price schedule so that you get the same amount for an office visit where the, whether you do the office visit in downtown Halifax where the rent's high or you're out in Muscadabit Valley where the rent is cheap. So, um, so if you're going to you know, encourage people to settle downtown or you're gonna build a new neighborhood somewhere out in the periphery, either way, you're going to need family doctors and clinics to locate there and, and the planning regulations are going to affect that the tax structure is going to affect that. Um, and I, I would say you need to sort of talk to the health authorities somewhat about planning where primary health care is available to the citizens, but the problem is that family doctors are small business people and the, the health authority doesn't provide their offices or have any control whatsoever over where they locate so um, you know, that being said, just because you build a new subdivision doesn't mean that everybody that moves into the subdivision immediately changes family doctors to the one that's close, because people like their family doctors and stick with them for decades. So you know, they'll, they'll travel for miles. And I had patients move to Moncton and keep coming back to see me. But, um, but people, on the other hand, I do hear from people about, you know, gee, we just, you know, there's 500 people moving into this new neighborhood somewhere up around the top of Larry Utec Boulevard, and gee, there's no medical clinics or doctors accepting patients. So do something about that, build a medical clinic out there. So, you know, in, in all of that stuff about the complete communities and making sure services were available, there was nothing really mentioned in there about primary health care, family doctors. It was just kind of not mentioned. So I just thought I'd make the comment and point out that it does need to be separately considered because it's it's not just like, you know, another Starbucks or another coffee shop or something. It's It requires forethought and planning. Great. Thank you. That's a useful comment. Yeah, I know that. Um, I mean, a lot of what we need to think about is just making sure that we don't have barriers to things. So sometimes it's less about, uh, you know, what we're encouraging to go where and more of just making sure that we don't have unnecessary barriers to things like like health clinics. And I know in some uh, some of our land use bylaws, um, uh, there's like a, an office of a professional person defined so that you could have, a, a, you know, a sole practitioner uh, working out of their home easily uh, in really any residential zone. So I you know that's something we can con continue to consider as well. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. You know, my, my second office in Cole Harbor, I mean, that was at a time when it was a separate municipality, but I mean, there was planning regulations at that time about how many parking spots you had to have per examining room, which kind of limited the size of your clinic based on the size of the lot you had and also guaranteed that you were gonna pave a large amount of territory that didn't need to be paved. So I think we've got rid of some of that stuff, but on the other hand, there's some strange regulations about what you can do where that just get in the way of easily setting up a medical clinic, for example. Thanks. Anyone wanna weigh in who hasn't weighed in? Okay, well, with that, then uh, Shiloh and Leah, I think hopefully that I think we a lot of lot of comments. So hopefully that that is what you wanted and is of assistance uh, going forward. And then just again, uh, you said it a couple times, but we can if we there's something that occurs to 
one or more of us after today, we're happy, you're happy to receive those comments uh, in, the, in the future as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Okay, well with that, um, why don't we move to the next item on the agenda, which is nothing. Um, I don't think there were no added items, um, at least on mine. Uh, that brings to the date of the next meeting, which is uh, July uh, 26, uh, 2021. Um, and with that, I will ask for a mover to adjourn. And moves for adjournment. So that's uh, it for today. So uh, everyone have a uh, great Monday and a great month. Right. Thanks so much. Thanks. See you later, Jason. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.